going to step outside of my comfort zone today. As a scientist, I uh, live and die by data. Um, and so normally I would tell you in detail about our research studies. Uh, but today I'm going to sort of take advantage of this incredible group of people, thought leaders, policymakers, investors, to talk about the future, uh, some ways in which neuroscience might impact education over the next five to 10 years. So my goal uh, in this presentation is to change your brain. It's to insert a memory in your head for my talk. Um, I can't do this directly. I can't get into your brains. Um, I have to use my words and the pictures I'll show you to try to trick your senses into transmitting information uh, into your brain. And I'm going to try to structure what I say and what I show to try to lead to you know, durable changes in your brain. If a friend later asks you what you saw today, um, they're likewise using language to worm their way into your brain to reactivate memories. Uh, which will then get expressed via your behavior, your language, uh, your actions. To the extent that uh, you're able to recall anything in that moment from what you saw in my talk, that depends on the fact that your brain is in the room right now, that something I said or showed changed your brain, and that you carried that knowledge to that conversation with your friend. This is uh, the kinds of changes I'm going to talk about are ones that happen through mere exposure. And this is a really uh, remarkable uh, feat. So um, to what extent uh, is education and training like this kind of experience that I just described? Viewed in this way, um, you might think of education as indirect. Um, what it is that we uh, learn and remember is based on external information that gets presented to us through instruction, uh, written materials, uh, technology. Likewise, how we assess knowledge in education is indirect. It requires the learner translating what they have in their brain into external uh, actions. Um, now, there's some challenges with this sort of indirect approach. In some ways, it's the best we can do. Uh, but it raises a whole host of problems that many people in this room and at this conference um, have, have grappled with. Uh, for example, if I'm now giving a talk to you, I don't know what's in your brains. I don't know your backgrounds. I don't know what you already know. And so in some ways, what I say is one size fits all. It's not personalized. Likewise, I have some plan for what I want to present today. Uh, but if you're getting it really well, I'm not, um, I'm not going faster because I don't really know that you're getting it really well. I'm not describing more simple or complex material based on how well what I'm saying is resonating in your brains. I don't know what's happening inside your head. And finally, by relying on this sort of external uh, input, this indirect form of education, um, I'm suffering from your co cognitive bottlenecks. And these include perceptual bottlenecks, uh, attentional bot bottlenecks, working memory limitations, and so on. So, uh, in some ways, by relying on external inputs, we're subject to these limitations. Um, likewise, on the um, assessment side of things, relying on people to translate what they have in their brain into external action poses a set of problems. For one, it's dependent on what questions I ask you. Um, so if I want to probe your knowledge, I design an exam or a test, and that assesses uh, information selectively, but I don't have a good global sense of what you know necessarily. Um, putting people in an evaluative context uh, raises all kinds of issues around test anxiety, uh, bias. Um, again, focusing on these sort of high pressure moments encourages uh, learning strategies, uh, studying techniques that are uh, not good at promoting long term retention and generalization, such as rote memorization. And finally, by relying on what you produce outside of your brain in written or technological form, um, there's the possibility to deceive, to produce something in the world that doesn't actually reflect what, ha what you have in your head, but what you copied from somebody else. What I want to talk about today is the possibility of doing something more direct. Um, to, to what extent can we uh, directly insert knowledge and skills into somebody's brain? 
There are a few different ways of doing this that we're thinking about. Uh, for example, um, if somebody's learning some information, can we encourage them to use the right brain regions or the right neural representations through reinforcement? Um, can we structure knowledge in their brains? Can we push concepts together or pull them apart? Can, while you're learning some material, can we push your brain into a state that makes it more ready to learn or ready to learn in the right way? On the assessment side, what if we could directly extract knowledge and skills from your brain? Uh, could I measure the proficiency in some domain, your knowledge in some domain, by comparing your brain activity while you're processing some information to an expert who knows that material really well? A form of neural assessment. Um, using sophisticated machine learning models, can I put you in some kind of brain imaging situation and extract the contents of your mind from your brain activity without requiring you to, to perform a test? Now, to be clear, I, I'm not talking about tasks inspired by neuroscience. I'm not talking about cognitive training. Uh, I'm not uh, talking um, about direct uh, brain training um, in the sense of tasks or games that I have you play. I mean uh, leveraging the brain itself in the learning process, uh, looping the brain into conventional platforms for education and training. How could we do this? How could we directly insert knowledge and assess knowledge in somebody's brain? Uh, the methods that we use in my lab are varied. Uh, they include functional magnetic resonance imaging, uh, behavioral testing, uh, intracranial recordings from epilepsy patients undergoing neurosurgery, um, uh, studies of people with brain damage, um, and computational models that are biologically inspired and help us capture uh, computational principles of, of neural processing. And what I'm gonna talk about today is really an amalgam of, of these different techniques. Now, we're, we're not there yet. <laughs> I'm not able to directly put knowledge in your brain other than through my voice. Um, but we've made progress in three areas that I wanna tell you about, and at, at the end, I'll review sort of what's left to be done. So uh, the first area where we've made some progress is we, we have a pretty good understanding now of uh, how and where memories are stored in the brain and how these memories change over time as you learn. A lot of the progress here came from work with uh, patients with brain damage, uh, like uh, this patient, Lonnie Sue Johnson. She's an astoundingly interesting person. I don't have time to go into her uh, story today, uh, but she suffered a, 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 an illness, viral encephalitis, that destroyed a, a part of her brain called the hippocampus. And this part of the brain is really critical for how you learn and remember information. Um, to illustrate uh, what it's like to interact with these patients, I thought I would show you a video of Lonnie Sue talking with her si sister and mother about an autobiographical event from her life. So I'll play this video and then I'll explain it afterwards. Do you know what the story is with Daddy? Why he's not here right now? What is he doing? Is he sick? No, well, you remember he died. <gasps> he died? What year did he die? 18 years ago. 18 years ago? Don't you remember we told you that? But... I think you did remember that. Sometimes. Well, the last time I saw him was... So this is obviously a, a tragic personal event, the death of her father. Uh, he died before she got sick, and so she's lost access to that memory after her brain injury. The other reason that this video um, is effective is that uh, this is not the first time that she's been told that her father died after she recovered. She, by, by some accounts, been told 100 times when they recorded this video. So this also illustrates that even if she can't remember the original event, she's unable to learn that this has happened through repeated exposures. It's these kinds of uh, patients that have given rise to a very detailed understanding of how different brain systems support learning and memory. Uh, just to show you uh, what her brain looks like internally, um, these little black areas here are where your hippocampus would normally be, um, and she's missing that entirely. Um, if you're interested in more information about Lonnie Sue, there's a New Yorker profile written about her and our research with her a few years ago called Lifelines. Now, patients like Lonnie Sue have revealed the critical role of the hippocampus in learning. Um, we now have a very detailed understanding of the circuitry and function of the hippocampus uh, that's come from a lot of work in both animal models and computational models. So if this is the hippocampus in the middle of your brain, if you were to take a slice through the middle and uh, show that from behind, uh, it would look like this. That little blue area is where your hippocampus is located. If we zoom in on that, uh, 
there's a, a little circuit diagram here that indicates how different subregions of this brain structure are connected. You can think of this as a computer circuit. There are different processors and they do different things and they have certain connectivity that transforms inputs in different ways. Um, this has been a big focus in my lab for the last uh, 10 years. Um, we can do very high resolution MRI studies of uh, the hippocampus to identify these different subregions, and then we can use functional MRI to figure out what kinds of information they code. Um, we've published a lot of work on this. Uh, I'm not going to go into it today, other than to say I think we have a pretty good handle on how the system works. To highlight um, sort of a summary of this work, uh, we've discovered that there are two pathways in the hippocampus. Um, so what I'm showing here is a neural network model. Each of those uh, Squares represents a layer of the model. You can think of this like a, a deep learning network for those who are familiar. The arrows indicate where there's connectivity between subregions of the model. Um, and so uh, the pathway in blue is called the trisynaptic pathway. This pathway is really critical for storing individual episodes. Your ability to remember this talk and keep it distinct from uh, the talk you saw beforehand or the talk you'll see after despite the fact that it's the same day, it's around the same time, it might be on a similar topic, you might, you're wearing the same clothes, you might be feeling the same way. There's a lot of similarities in what's happening right now, and yet this pathway is able to store that memory as completely distinct from other memories. So this is really important for remembering specific events from your life. Um, the other pathway uh, in green here, the monosynaptic pathway, doesn't learn individual experiences, but rather aggregates across experiences. It's able to uh, learn over time what are the commonalities in my experiences. This may be important for language learning, figuring out which sounds go together to form words. This may be important for navigation, learning the layout of a city by navigating around. Um, this kind of generalized learning is, it gives rise to the kinds of concepts that we train in education and may be a particularly important source of uh, learning in education. So this is our current theoretical understanding in cognitive neuroscience about how one part of the brain at least stores uh, memories and learns over time. So that's just to say that we have some theoretical um, uh, perspective on how learning impacts the brain. Now, um, obviously, to the extent we want to apply these theories uh, to education, we need to think about development. Um, this is a really, uh, a relatively new research program for us. Um, but a couple of years ago, we started uh, studying, doing brain imaging research, specifically functional MRI, uh, with infants and toddlers, and over time, older kids. Um, part of the reason we're studying uh, kids at this age is that this is an incredible period of learning. Um, this is a video shown, several pictures of a baby growing up. The first two years of life, your brain becomes adult size. Of course, the function continues to change, but by age two, your brain is almost adult size. This is also the period in which uh, every baby who's exposed to language learns that language, um, during which you learn to control your body and, and to walk, during which you learn the names of objects, uh, develop food preferences, learn about social relationships. Um, if you want to understand learning, this is the time to study it. This is when a lot of the action happens. So we're interested in both this from a developmental perspective and as a case study of a biological system that learns extraordinarily well and for which we don't actually have a great understanding of the brain systems that give rise to that. So um, a few years ago, uh, we started doing uh, brain imaging studies in babies and toddlers. Um, there, at the time, were tens of thousands of fMRI studies in adults, but only four in infants and toddlers who are awake and behaving and being given tasks, looking at things, having their behavior monitored. Um, and so this is a wide open field. Now, there's obviously technical reasons why uh, there's very little research in this domain, which is that babies move a lot, they squirm, they don't follow instructions, it's hard to recruit families to put their babies in an MRI machine, et cetera. Um, but we've, we've solved many of these technical issues. Uh, and um, for example, here's a video of a four month old baby getting an fMRI scan. Uh, a couple weeks ago. So right now that baby's looking at visual information on the screen, we're studying their ability to do visual learning and we're able to extract brain activity uh, from, from their head. So I think this is gonna give us a foothold for understanding uh, brain development and, uh, and learning at this critical period of great plasticity. 
Uh, so we've now collected a considerable amount of, of high quality data from infants and toddlers. Um, here's a structural scan of 11 month old baby's uh, brain, um, zooming in through their head. These are structural data and then we overlay on this data from the function of their brain, what parts of their brain are active, how different brain systems are learning and responding. Uh, we now have uh, a total of um, 64 data sets collected from infants and toddlers. So what I'm plotting here is a histogram of the number of sessions as a function of the age of the baby. Uh, hopefully it'll come up here, there we go. Um, and so uh, we have many, many scans now in five month olds to 10 month olds. Uh, these 64 data sets are from kids under three years old. Um, and each of these kids has done multiple tasks related to perception, attention, learning, and memory. And we're really trying to study the neural underpinnings of cognitive development. Uh, we just opened a new brain imaging center that's kid friendly and we're adding two or three uh, babies a week to this, uh, to this database. And what I'm most excited about is you'll notice that this curve is heavily biased to the left. Um, as time passes, we're gonna be filling out more and more cells to the right as kids get older and adding more babies early on. And the goal here is to understand both early learning but then also to longitudinally predict outcomes as the kids develop. So we hope for a whole lifespan of, of brain imaging from three months on. Okay, so now we have uh, at least uh, an infrastructure to collect uh, brain imaging data from babies. Um, we're able to understand uh, the development of learning and memory and hopefully apply that uh, in slightly older kids. To get back to what I originally started with, how can we use this understanding to track the contents of a person's brain uh, in real time so that we can make changes to what they're learning or what they're shown um, to try to improve their learning, to personalize learning, accelerate learning, and how can we use these methods to assess what they ultimately learn, how those changes occur in their brain. Um, for this, uh, I'm gonna talk about an approach that we developed um, called real-time fMRI. Uh, and this is um, uh, an approach to doing brain imaging where you analyze the data on the fly. And we're gonna use this to try to improve people's uh, cognitive abilities. But the idea is that you could use similar kinds of techniques to try to um, control in a closed loop manner what learning materials a person is exposed to. Um, I thought that uh, I, would, I would illustrate this approach with a study we did on what's um, known as sustained attention. This is your ability to pay attention over time. This is something that we're all really bad at, and just to uh, liven things up, I'm gonna show you a little demonstration of how bad we are at it. Uh, I'm gonna show you a video, and there's two images in the video, and they're just gonna flicker back and forth. Image one, image two, image one, image two. Uh, little audience participation. I'll have you put up your hand when you see what's different between the two images. Okay, I'll show you a video. It's gonna flicker, put up your hand when you see what's different. Nobody? It's pretty obvious. Okay, a few people. Don't feel too bad, the median reaction time is 30 seconds. Okay, so for people who haven't seen it, if I said look at the railing, okay, you see it immediately. It's right in front of you. Um, and if you ever see this again, you're gonna see it right away. Attention filters what enters into awareness, what we see. Okay, so this is obviously a, a weird situation where the world's changing in front of your eyes, uh, but this inability to pay attention has uh, real world uh, impacts um, in the classroom and in social interactions, even certain professions like baggage screening, radiology, required sustained attention. So we wanted to develop a system where we could try to improve people's sustained attention. Um, to do that, uh, we developed in a, a closed loop adaptive brain imaging uh, design. Um, in this task, people were shown pictures like the following. Um, in this picture, you'll see two components. There's a face and a room. And we told people to pay attention to one of the two pictures, pay attention to the scene. And we uh, scanned their brain, and then we extracted the data in real time and used machine learning to interpret what they were paying attention to. And the hypothesis is that you might not realize that you're losing focus until it's too late normally, but maybe we could see signatures in the brain of people not attending properly and uh, train people to be more sensitive to those signatures. So uh, when they saw this picture, if they were told to pay attention to the scene, but actually uh, we found that they were paying attention to the face or that they were distracted, um, we uh, changed the task. You know, a second later, now all of a sudden the task is harder. 
We made it so that it's harder to see the scene that you're supposed to be paying attention to. Um, this is kind of punishment if you think about it. You know, you're having trouble and now we made it harder for you. But that trains you that that's a bad state to be in by getting negative feedback. Um, conversely, if you're paying attention properly, uh, we reward you by making the task easier, by making it easier to see the scene that you're paying attention to. Um, and so people did this for about an hour where they got feedback essentially of what is a good and a bad attentional state by bringing their brain into the experiment in a closed loop fashion. Just to show you what this looks like, um, on the left uh, where it says indoor is what the participant in the experiment saw. Um, so they're told in this case pay attention to the scene and press a button every time you see an indoor scene. And the top right is what our machine learning algorithm says that they're paying attention to. And in the bottom right is how we updated the task based on what they were paying attention to. So I'll start this video now and then uh, I'll talk over it a little bit. Okay, so now we start showing pictures, we're getting brain data in real time, we're passing it through our algorithm, uh, and what we see at first is that they're distracted, they're paying attention to the face. And what you'll see on the left is that now the face gets easier to see. In other words, the thing that they're supposed to be paying attention to is getting faded out of the image. They then recover and are paying better attention to the scene, um, and they get rewarded by the task becoming easier, becoming easier to see the scene. Their brain is controlling what they see on the screen, and we're reinforcing good states and punishing bad states. And what we found as a result of doing this is that just one session of doing this, um, outside of the scanner from before to after this, uh, this training, we found improved uh, attentional abilities. We found that just one session was able to improve people's ability to sustain their attention even though these were undergraduate students who had an entire lifetime of practice trying to sustain attention, this one little intervention had, had an impact. Um, this has all kinds of clinical applications that I'm not gonna go into, uh, but this is a general approach for building the brain into experiments, adaptive experiments. And so we've used this to try to improve memory recall, to try to induce learning in the laboratory. And I think this kind of methodology uh, could be used now um, as a way of more directly trying to um, educate the brain. So uh, this gives the outlines of, a, of an approach that one might use where uh, for now, let's say you use MRI, you acquire brain data while somebody is learning uh, some material or using their knowledge of some material. Uh, we then uh, transfer the data to our computer infrastructure, perform some analysis. For example, where we might figure out what brain regions are active, how similar is their brain to somebody who's an expert in this material, where we try to reconstruct what they're thinking about or paying attention to. And then we're going to use the results of that analysis to change what we're showing them, to select some new learning materials, um, to try to bias them to use certain representations in their brain. And by changing the task, we then change what their brain is doing, which in turn influences their brain activity the next time step. That's what I mean by closed loop. The brain is used to select or change the learning materials, which is then impacting their brain and so on. So there's a feedback loop. Now, if you remember at the beginning, I talked about the possibility of measuring, sort of doing neural assessment, measuring the expression of knowledge directly from the brain. That's really just the first half of this loop where you would expose somebody to some material and you would see, is their brain processing that information like an expert would? Are they paying attention to the right information? Are they coding for all of the details? The second part of the loop is how you would do more direct um, uh, acquisition of knowledge where you would then use that information about what they've learned, what they have in their head to craft uh, the next phase of learning. Uh, and this repeats. Okay, so um, those are just sort of three areas where we've made some progress. And to finish up, what I'll say is that there's still a lot needed to bring this to fruition. I think we're five to 10 years away from being able to directly manipulate the contents of the brain and assess knowledge from brain activity. One is that um, we're working on uh, principles of learning, uh, learning rules um, that might be effective at promoting efficient and uh, durable knowledge. So there's different learning rules in the brain and can we customize our, our procedure to take advantage of uh, effective learning rules. Um, a better understanding of what can be induced. Can I put specific knowledge in your brain or is it more about changing your mindset so that you're more prepared to learn material as an expert? Uh, 
Obviously, we can't deploy MRI machines to the classroom, so uh, can we develop uh, precise devices, more precise than wearable EEG caps, so caps that are able, or devices that are able to measure very specific neural representations, but that are portable, affordable, so that we can deploy this at scale. Alternatively, we might be able to um, use precise methods like MRI to figure out what signatures in those lower resolution devices capture the kinds of neural representations we care about. That is, use uh, some kind of translation to more portable devices uh, to do this in the wild. Um, we need to test different domains of knowledge, uh, different uh, conceptual domains in the classroom, different areas of, of work. Um, we need more data to build robust models uh, for interpreting brain activity and learning. And finally, I think, and, and why I'm here, is that we need partnerships and input from education and technology sectors uh, to learn how to connect this to the, to the real world. And so I'm really delightful, uh, delighted to uh, have had the opportunity to uh, share these ideas with you, and I look forward to your uh, feedback after the talk. Um, I'd like to say please email me if you want to uh, talk more about this. Um, and I'm very lucky to work with some really um, tremendous graduate students and postdocs who did a lot of this research in my lab. And thank you very much.